you think about arrivals, you realize that waiting is hard, but arrivals are a blessing if it's, if it's the right arrival, something you're looking forward to. And Sherry and I have learned a lot about the, the blessing of arrivals and reconnecting because we now live 2,000 miles away from all of our grandchildren. Two of our three sons uh, are married, have families, and now live in Michigan where they were, where they were raised. Uh, they're raising their families in Michigan, but that means that all four of our grandkids are 2,000 miles away. So when we get to come and visit them, it's always exciting. It's exciting for us to arrive, and it's exciting for them to have us arrive. And what we're discovering is each of our grandkids are at different times of seasons of life, and so they have different awareness of, of us coming. And, and so we had people ask us before we became grandparents, what are your grandkids going to call you? And we're like, we don't know. We're going to wait and find out what they call us. Well, they call me Pa, and Sherry has become Maga. And you say, my God, where does that come from? Well, Cohen, our oldest, our, our firstborn grandchild, he was trying to say grandma, grandma, and he went, my God. He got it backwards. And we laughed. And he's a bit of a comedian. And he thought it was funny that we laughed. So he kept calling her my God, my God. And then we laughed, and it was just locked in. So she's now my God. So, they're, they, so they're wait, they wait for the arrival of Pa and my God. Now, our youngest grandchild, uh, who is now in Bryn's womb, uh, hasn't been, not as grand, our grandchild on the inside, on the outside, yet, but our grandchild nonetheless, our youngest one, has no clue what's going on. The next one, Kel, Zach, and Christine's little guy, is not a year old yet, so he's not sure what's going on. Piper, who now is a year and a half going towards two years old, is aware of what's going on, and she gets excited, but Cohen is old enough, he's three and a half pushing towards four, he understands that we're going to come see them. But if you tell Cohen, Pa and Magar are coming in a month, or a week, or three days, he doesn't really understand how the time thing works totally yet. He just knows that we're coming soon. But if they tell him the morning we're going to arrive, if they say, Pa and Magar are coming today, he gets that. And he gets all excited. So we, so we had the privilege, and thank you as a church for giving us time off periodically because we had a chance to go be with Sherry's grandmother for her, I mean, Sherry's mom for her 80th birthday. And also one of our sons for his birthday. And other, we had a bunch of family things that we were able to do and spend Thanksgiving with our two sons that don't live here. So we thank you for giving us time away as a, as a couple the last few weeks to be able to be with them. But when we rolled in the driveway to Nate and Bryn's house where three of our grandkids live, this is what we saw on the front porch. So there's Bryn, who used to be a worship leader here, and Cohen, and Piper Joy, and baby X Harney, who's in, the, uh, in, the, in, in Bryn's belly still. Uh, and our welcome to Michigan sign, and a lot of joy. And it, it was just, it was one of those things where we realized, and then after we got there, they got up and ran over, and we got the hugs, and just got to have the family time. It's like, oh, there's something sweet about arrivals. But there's that waiting. There's that waiting. Well, think about the people of God in the ancient world. When the prophets begin to prophesy, there's going to be an arrival that Emmanuel, God, with us is going to show up. That God, not just, not just Pa and Maga, not just family or a friend, but God is going to show up in human history. You've got to believe that the excitement for that arrival must have been building. But it was building not over days or weeks or months or years or decades. It was, a, it was building over centuries. And so Isaiah... Isaiah in Isaiah 7:14 writes these words, "Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel, God with us." Anticipation, Emmanuel is coming. In Isaiah chapter 9, we read these words, "For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor." Mighty God, everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Man, the anticipation grows, but, but decades go by, and, and he hasn't come yet. There's this anticipation of the arrival of God. Micah builds to the story. But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will rule over Israel, my people, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. There's going to be an arrival of this Savior. Zechariah adds to the prophetic promise of the coming Messiah. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. I could spend the entire rest of this sermon reading passage after passage after passage from the Old Testament, prophesying the coming of Emmanuel, God with us, the arrival. 
There's so many passages that said that, that the Savior will come, the Messiah will come, God will come to dwell among you and bring salvation to the world. So you know that there's, there's this excitement, this anticipation, but generation goes by and generation goes by, and they're waiting for the arrival. And then God shows up, humbly, quietly, in a manger. The arrival of God Almighty into human history, into our world, into our lives. So from now until the first Sunday of 2022, we're going to think together about the arrival of God, the arrival of hope, the arrival of joy, the arrival of Jesus into the world. And each week, we're going to walk through kind of a rhythm of, of how, how Jesus arrives in three different ways. We're going to start by kind of the, the arrival, the incarnation, the birth of Jesus when, when God first came into human history that first Christmas. And we're going to focus each week on when Jesus arrived historically into this world in a manger in Bethlehem. But we're also going to focus on the arrival of Jesus, the arrival of God in our lives the inspiration, the joy, the passion that comes when we recognize that not only did Jesus arrive 2,000 years ago, but on the in the Sacramento River Delta almost four decades ago, when I first met Jesus, he arrived in my heart. When Sherry was five years old, he arrived in her heart. For many of you here, many of you online, you've met Jesus. He arrived, he showed up, and you've been inspired and transformed by the presence of the living God. And if you're not yet a Christian... You can know this. If you put your faith in Jesus, he will arrive and move into your life and never leave you. Now and for eternity. That's amazing. So we're going to talk about the arrival, the incarnation of Jesus when he first came. We're going to talk about the arrival of Jesus in our lives when we put our faith in him. And when we walk with him, he arrives again and again and again. And the inspiration that that brings. But we're also going to talk about this. And I want you to, get, you to get your minds around this this Christmas season. When you put your faith in Jesus and when you walk with him, everywhere you go, Jesus arrives with you. Every room you walk into, every situation, every time in your car driving down the road, he is there with you. When you become a follower of Jesus, the spirit of Jesus moves into you and never leaves. So when you arrive, he arrives with you. God's still arriving today. I often tell people, I met Jesus before I ever met Jesus. Because my sister Gretchen had become a Christian and she showed me the presence of Jesus. This young college guy, Doug, had become a Christian and he showed me the presence of Jesus. This guy, Dan Webster, this youth pastor, preached the message of Jesus. Before I ever met Jesus personally, I was seeing Jesus in ordinary people in whom the Spirit of God lives. So every week, through this, this, over, over the next six messages, we're going to talk about how Jesus arrived on Christmas, the, arri the incarnation. We're going to talk about the inspiration of how Jesus arrives in our hearts and our lives. And we're going to talk about the illustration we are of the presence of Jesus everywhere we go. You follow that? Yes. Incarnation, inspiration, illustration. All right? And so let's, let's begin with that first part, the, the incarnation, the arrival, the first arrival of Jesus. Arrival incarnation, when Jesus came into our world, God entered human history. When Jesus was born, God showed up. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 1. And we're going to read at different portions of this chapter and really look at how this is, this is, this is John, the Gospel of John's Christmas story. The Gospel of John doesn't have donkeys and doesn't have uh, wise men and doesn't have a manger. It tells the story theologically from God leaving the glory of heaven and coming among us. The living word of God coming to be the incarnate word of God. So look with me at John chapter 1 beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and that word there is Jesus. Jesus, God, the Logos, the presence of Jesus. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, through Jesus, all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Move down to verse 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. This is Jesus. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. 
Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, that's when you put your faith in Jesus, become his follower, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent or of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. And the word became flesh. That's the Christmas story. That's the manger. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then verse 17. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, he has made him known. Man, there's a lot there. And John paints this picture of the coming, the incarnation. So when Jesus arrived, and this is a theological term, incarnation. It's it's a, a word that was actually in the song that Amy just sang, the incarnate word of God. That God came and was enfleshed, embodied. He came among us. The one who was eternal spirit became one of us. It's staggering. It's amazing to even try to get your mind around that reality. So when you look at the Gospel of John and you think about the the first coming of Jesus, the arrival of Jesus, what's going on there? Here's some of the things we learned from John. That Jesus is eternal God. The Word was with God and the Word was God. This one, when when you picture Jesus in a manger, don't you see this cute little snuggly baby? Say, God is with us. When you see Jesus walking with the broken and the hurting of his day, when you read the Gospels, say, God was with them. When you see Jesus with nails pinned to a cross, bearing our sin and taking our shame, you say, God is with us. The Jesus who came incarnate among us was God in human flesh. That's staggering. Jesus is also creator God. In verse 3, Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Everything that has been made has been made through Jesus. That's amazing. That baby born in the manger is the creator God who made everything. And so when you get up and and you drive along the coast here in Monterey, and you see the ocean and the beauty of that, and you're, you're overwhelmed, just pause and say, God, thank you. Jesus, thank you. You who made all things. When you drive through the Salinas Valley in the morning or the evening where the shadows are kind of long over the hills there and some of the richest farmland in the world, and you look at that place and you say, oh, God, thank you for the beauty of creation. When you pet your kitty cat or your puppy dog or when you come home and they greet you and you say, Lord, thank you that you've made all things. And you know the apex, the pinnacle, the top of all of God's creation when you read the book of Genesis? You know what the absolute top is? is Genesis is building, building, building to the climax and the apex of God's amazing creation. And you know what's at the very top of that? People. People. People are, when you meet another person, when you see another person say, God made that woman. God made that man. God created them. Thank you, Jesus. Even the people that might irritate you sometimes, even the people that you're on the other side of the aisle on on issues, say, wait, that is a person made in the image of God. We forget sometimes that through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Thank you, Lord, for your creation. The incarnate God is the creator God. Jesus is our source of light and life. And wow, do we need to be reminded of that today in the darkness and the conflict and the polarized world that we live in. Say, God, into this dark world, you came as the light. Into this world of brokenness and death, you breathe life. Man, let's keep our eyes on this incarnate Jesus who is light and life in our brokenness and our darkness. And cry out, oh, Jesus, be the light within me and shine your light through me. This is the Jesus who came among us. Jesus came as God in human flesh. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He didn't just come as one of us. He walked among us. He touched the broken and the hurting and the suffering. People with leprosy, who everyone else ran away from, he went to and touched. He came among us. God, Emmanuel, God with us. Do you get that picture? When you think about the birth of Jesus, let all these things kind of flood your mind and flood your soul and be overwhelmed that God arrived in human history into our world. This Jesus is the source of grace and truth. In verse 17 of John, 
Grace and truth came through Jesus. Every time Jesus shows up, you know what comes with him every time? Grace and truth. Tenderness and truth. Unmerited favor and absolutely pure truth. And we have to be careful as Christians. If as Christians, if we're the type of Christians that says, well, I want to hold on to grace, 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 but I want to forget about truth, you lose the Christian message. It becomes kind of squishy, sentimental, everything's fine, no problems. If you hold on to truth, 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 and you get rid of grace, you become legalistic and dogmatic and kind of hard to be around. But Jesus didn't come with just grace. He didn't just come with truth. Jesus came with what? Grace and truth. So you read the story in the Gospel of John about a woman who's caught in the act of adultery. She's sinning against God and against another person. And she's brought to this courtyard where Jesus is. And the religious leaders who want to see Jesus kind of caught into a difficult situation say, well, the law says the punishment would be a death sentence. She should be stoned to death. That's what the law Jesus, what do you say? In their mind, they're thinking, gotcha, Jesus. But what they didn't recognize is Jesus always comes with grace and truth. So how does Jesus respond? Grace and truth. Okay, the one of you that's never sinned, you throw the first stone at her. Well, they'd all sinned. We all have. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So you know what the text in John says? It says that one by one they left the courtyard. They dropped their stones. They left the courtyard starting with the oldest. Why did the oldest leave first? I have two theories. One, because they were wise enough to realize what Jesus was saying. And two, they were older so they had a lot more time to sin. Okay? But one by one they dropped the rocks and they walked out of the courtyard until you have to picture this. All that's left is two people. The woman standing in judgment. And Jesus not looking down on her, but Jesus kneeling on the ground, drawing on the ground, and he looks up at her, and he says, woman, where are they? Is there no one here to condemn you? She says, no one, Lord. Now watch what Jesus says. Neither do I condemn you, grace. Now go and leave your life of sin, truth. You follow that? Grace and truth brought together. And this Jesus that we follow always brings the grace of heaven and the truth. He said to this woman, you've been sinning, don't continue on your sin. He didn't want her to destroy her life and destroy her soul by continuing in sin, but he showed her grace. And those things go hand in hand. They need to go hand in hand in our lives as well. Jesus is the source of grace and truth. So when we think about Jesus and his incarnation, we, we, we worship him, we glorify him, we celebrate him. He is, he is creator, he is God with us, he is light, he is life, he brings grace, he give, brings truth. That would be enough. I mean, that would be enough just to be like, wow, Jesus, thank you. He's arrived. Then he showed up, fully God, with us. But also, he keeps showing up. His arrival, and this brings inspiration and joy to our hearts, is that Jesus is here with us and he's in us. God enters our hearts, our lives, and our homes. Jesus shows up again and again when you first put your faith in him, and then when you walk with him, Jesus keeps showing up in your life. He arrives now. He arrives when you put your faith in him, and he stays and lives in you, and you sense his presence again and again and again. So in Colossians, in Colossians chapter 1, uh, there's this amazing passage that paints this picture of Jesus. And I want you to hear this as this is the Jesus who arrives in our hearts. If you're a Christian, he arrived in your heart and moved in with you when you put your faith in, when you came to the cross and received Jesus. If you're not a Christian, he is the one who will arrive and show up in your heart and life and never leave you if you put your faith in him. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, talking about Jesus. The Son is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He, Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, in Jesus, and through him 
to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, listen to this, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Here's the inspiration you need this Christmas season. That Jesus has arrived in your life if you're a Christian. And he hasn't left you. Even when things seem difficult and challenging and you might feel like he's far away, he has arrived and he'll never leave you. So if we believe this with all of our hearts, then we can be at peace because he is Lord over all. We can say, Jesus, I can stand right now inspired by your presence. You've arrived in my life and I can actually live with peace in this crazy world because you are Lord over all. There is one king, there is one Lord, there is one ruler. His name is Jesus. Someone say amen. amen. He, he rules, he reigns, and he is Lord of your life, and he's Lord of this universe. Even when it doesn't look like it to us, he's still on the throne. So, what's causing you tension? What's causing you anxiety? I know a lot of you and a lot of your stories. There's a lot of people dealing with lots of tension and lots of anxiety. And if you say, Jesus, you have arrived, yes, in your incarnation, but you have arrived in my life. I'm not alone. Bring your peace to me. Oh, ask him for that. He's waiting to instill peace in your heart in this crazy, crazy world. If we know that he has arrived in our hearts and our lives, then we can take a deep breath. Because he holds all things together. Verse 17 of Colossians 1 says, says, he holds all things together. Here's my question. What's coming apart in your life? What's it like, oh my gosh, this, it, it may be family stuff, man, it's, it's coming apart. It might be your personal health, it's coming apart. It might be just kind of political, social stuff. Things are just coming apart and the, the world's unraveling. And then we're told he holds all things together. Do you believe that? And if you do, would you cry out to him? in that place of your life where things feel like they're unraveling. Oh, Lord, remind me, Jesus, incarnate, inspiring, living God who's with me, that you hold all things together. Lord, hold me together. I feel like what's unraveling right now is just me. I feel like I'm unraveling. If that's you, say, God, hold me together. And he can do what we can't do. And he's ready to reveal his power and his presence. He holds all things together. We can join in because he is the Lord of the church. I'm hearing a rumbling. Is that our sound system or is that a plane landing on our helicopter on our roof? It's going away. Thank you. Good. We're right near the airport. You never know. Join in. He is the Lord of the church. In verse 18 of Colossians 1, it says, he is the head of the body. He is the head of the church. You need to know something. I need to tell you who's in charge of Shoreline Church. It is not our leadership team as great and wise as they are. Who is in charge of Shoreline Church? It's not me as the lead pastor. It's not any of our other pastors. It's not our directors or our staff. Who is the head of the church? One, two, three. Jesus. Somebody jumped ahead of me. Thank you. Somebody, uh, God, Jesus, thank you. He, he, is, he is the head of the church. He rules and he reigns. And can I tell you something? If you're online and you're saying, and maybe you're saying, listen, I'll watch church online, but I'm not going to go to a church building anymore and be around those people because those people have hurt me and those people are imperfect people. If, if that's why you're staying away from church, because there's imperfect people who might hurt you, then you'll never find a church. And if you do, please don't go there, because you'll ruin it. <laughs> because you're not perfect, and I'm not perfect. We're not perfect. I know people that walk away from the church because they say, oh, this person hurt me or that person hurt me. Well, we, you know, we, here's the truth for us. We have been saved by the grace of Jesus. We're being put together from our broken places. And I hope step by step and week by week and month by month, we're becoming more like Jesus. I hope after three or six months, every time you, know, if you can look back and say, you know, I'm, I'm showing more compassion. I'm showing more patience. I'm showing more of the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. But we're not perfect yet. But Jesus is the head of the church and we're his family. Whether you're online, out on the courtyard, family worship venue, or here in the worship center, we're his family. and We belong to each other. He's the head of the church. Let's work at being family together and loving his church. We can live with confidence that he's conquered hell, the grave, and death. He is reconciling all things. He's putting all things together. But because of Jesus, because he, he arrived in human history 2,000 years ago, because he's arriving in our lives right now, we can walk in the reality that he has conquered sin and death and hell and the devil, devil and the demonic world and all things that come against us. He's already run the victory. Amen? Amen. 
We just finished a series in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 20, 21, tell the story. We know how it ends. Now there's skirmishes in this battle that still happen in this world, but we know how the story ends. And it ends with a throne and God in glory and the enemy cast down. So we walk through our life, understanding that because he's arrived and he's here, we can walk with that confidence of the victory of Jesus. We can worship Jesus because he has paid the final price. He paid the price for our sins. He covered the cost for all of our wrongs and all, the, all of our debts. And we can worship him. This is one of the reasons why we pray for other churches. Sherry led us in prayer today for Carmel Presbyterian Church and Pastor Tim Yee, who's a good friend of mine, and they're, 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 we're partners in the ministry together. These churches, we're part of the body of Christ because we're worshiping the same Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. We're not in competition with other churches. We're in partnership with the body of Christ all over the world and around our community, and we rejoice in that. And so, so celebrate that and walk in that. And so, so the first picture of arrival is is. The first Christmas, Jesus arrived, God Almighty incarnate came among us. The second picture is that when you put your faith in Jesus and when you walk with Jesus, Jesus arrives again and again and again. You have incarnation, but you have inspiration. We're inspired to live for God. Why? Because he's arrived. He lives in us. He's with us. Praise the Lord. But there's one more arrival we have to talk about. And that's the arrival that I call illustration. That everywhere we go, Jesus goes with us. You can't, say, you can't say to Jesus, hey, Jesus, listen, where I'm going today, you're not going to want to see what's going on here. It's not pretty. Wait at home. Doesn't work that way. Where you go, Jesus goes with you. So Jesus keeps arriving and arriving in our world. We try to get people to come and visit church. That's a good thing to do. I hope many of you invite people to Christmas services this next month. It's going to be a great time for non-believers or visitors to come. That's great. We try to tell people the story of Jesus. That's great, too. We need to do that but we can show the presence of Jesus in how we live and we, can, and we can tell the story of Jesus through our words. Wherever we go, Jesus shows up with us. So here's the third arrival, arrival I call illustration. When we walk into any room, Jesus comes with us. We share the gift of Jesus with others. We share that gift with every person we encounter. I can think through my life right now. I could, I could give you over 200 examples of people I know that when I see them, I see the presence of Jesus in them and how they live. One person is a, is a guy named Carl Overbeek. Carl, I asked Carl, I think almost a decade ago, if he would mentor me. He's a pastor about 20 years further down the road than I am. And he loves Jesus. He loves the church. He's retired years ago. But I said, Carl, would you pour into my life? And in Carl, I see the grace of Jesus. About every four to six weeks, eight weeks, we talk on the phone or we Zoom and have a conversation. And every time I talk with him, I feel the grace of Jesus through Carl. Why? Because Jesus lives in him. There's a guy named Chuck Van Ingen, Reverend Dr. Charles Van Ingen. He held the chair of the Theology of World Mission at Fuller Seminary for years. He runs a seminary for all of Latin America for doc doctor doctoral students. His students, when, when he was a seminary teacher, his students, I think that they could turn their papers into him in six different languages, and he could speed read all six languages. One of the most brilliant people I've ever met. And when I, when I interact with Chuck, I see the truth of Jesus. I see Jesus in, in, in Chuck. He's got a mind that captures the truth and the glory of Jesus and expresses it in such a humble, gentle way. But I see truth in him. I think of Lucille Patmos, a woman who's been mentoring Sherry for 25 years, 30 years. And losing her, she, Lucille is now in her 90s. And, and when, I, when I see Lucille, I see a gentleness of Jesus. When she walks into the room, Jesus shows up with her. And you see the gentleness. If, if, she were to come, if she were in this room right now, and if she saw you, she'd say, oh, sweetie, how are you doing? And she, she, just, she has this way. She just brings this gentle tenderness. I, if I did it, it would freak people out. I'm not, you know, I'm, Hi, sweetie. You know, I'm on. But that, that, that's Lucille. Why? It's Jesus in her. You following me? Yeah. This is who we're supposed to be when we become more and more like Jesus. There's a couple who model for me the love of lost people who are far from Jesus, hurting and broken. They happen to be guests in our church today, uh, Wes and Claudia Dupin. I'm not going to make them stand up and embarrass them, but they're a couple that retired a couple months ago from a lifetime of full-time ministry, and now they're going to be doing other kinds of ministry. But when I see Wes and Claudia, I see a heart that loves lost and broken people and would do anything for them. That's Jesus. I see Jesus in them. Sherry's parents, Sherwin and Joan Vleem, the 
just, just the ability to be present with people. When I'm with Sherwin or Joan, they are just, they're there. When I watch them with their great-grandkids or their grandkids or Sherry and I, I they just, they are, they love people. If you're with them, it's like you're, you're the world and they're there. I think that, that's what Jesus was when he was with people. He was so present with them. I learned to be more like Jesus through them. If I want to look to somebody and see the gentle love of Jesus, I look at my wife, Sherry. I see a gentleness and a kindness and a compassion towards hurting people in my wife, and I see the presence of Jesus in her. And when I see it, I want to be more like Jesus. Not because, not because of her, but because Jesus lives in her. You get the picture? So, so, so Jesus arrived. He came in his incarnation. Jesus arrived in our lives or will arrive in your life if you say yes to him and you have the inspiration of his presence in you and he'll never leave you. But Jesus also arrives when we illustrate his presence, when, we, when you and I become more and more like Jesus. This Christmas season, would you look at where you work, where you live, where you shop, when you're gonna gather with people and recognize that if you're a Christian, when you walk in the room, Jesus shows up with you. And not to put too much pressure on you, but if people know you're a Christian, when they look at you, they think that's what Jesus looks like. And that could be good or that could be bad. But let's understand that we walk with Jesus and we walk in his presence. In Philippians chapter two, another passage that just gives this, this beautiful picture of Jesus arriving, coming among us. In Philippians two, verse six says this, Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And then one last passage from Hebrews. And this passage, boy, if you could let this capture your heart, what a picture it gives of the incarnate, living, present Jesus who goes with us everywhere we go. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. Listen to these words. This is Jesus. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. That's our Jesus. That's the one who goes with us everywhere we go. That, the, the God who came the God who entered your life when you put your faith in him and who lives in you, that God goes with you everywhere you go. So God is still arriving. And I want, I want to encourage you, invite people to church, invite people to, to learn about Jesus, but most of all, take Jesus with you everywhere you go. Where are you going to be tomorrow? He's there with you. Recognize that. And when you recognize that, here's, here's some of the ways we can respond. We can serve like Jesus served, and people will notice. Every situation you walk into, Keep your eyes open. When you're out around town, out shopping, keep your eyes open. If there's a need, you take action and serve. You let the Holy Spirit kind of nudge you, and you respond. And right now, we're at a time where people are freaked out, man. I don't want to, what if I help somebody? I don't want to help my one. We're so nervous about doing anything. But man, if you can serve in the name of Jesus, in this broken, conflicted time, his light will shine. Pay attention all the time. And serve everywhere you can in the name of Jesus. Love like Jesus loved. Because the world is waiting. And just say, Lord, how can I love people well? If you've got walls up between people, conflict with people, unforgiveness, man, deal with it. This Christmas season, deal with it. Love the way Jesus loved. And you will show his presence and show his glory. And then tell the wonderful story. And live out that story. Of the, that the price is paid. And love is here. Let people know who Jesus is, and what he has done. You can, in words, explain to people the difference Jesus has made in your life. You can talk to somebody who's not a Christian, and you can tell them, you know what, I gotta tell you, I've never felt more loved in my life. Never more loved in my life. What do you mean? Man, the way that God is loving me, the way that Jesus, this Christmas season, I'm thinking about how Jesus came and left heaven 
And he he went, I'm dying on a cross for me because he loves me. And just tell your story of understanding the love of God. And then you can look at somebody and say, you know, you need to know, he loves you like that too. He loves you like he loves me. People say, you think so? Most people think if there is a God that God doesn't love them. They don't know. They don't know what we know. That there is a God who laid his life down for us. And he did it for them too. So tell about his love. Tell about his peace. So you know in this crazy world, man, things are upside down. But can I tell you something? I feel a peace. I can't even put into words. I feel a peace in the midst of all this. You do? Oh, yeah. Where, how? Where does that come from? It comes from knowing Jesus who came. He's with me. He holds all things together. He made everything. I know how the story ends. I feel peace. And by the way, he wants you to have that peace too. That'll open up the door to a spiritual conversation. Talk about who Jesus is to you, what he's done for you. You can say, he, he provides for me. You can say, I've been, I feel so provided for in this time where people are so nervous about their future. I feel provided for. And, and, I, and who's, well, how's that happen? It's Jesus. He provides, and he wants to provide for you too. You can share your story of how you experienced Jesus. You can talk about his protection. All of us have stories. All of us have stories where you go, man, I just know that God is watching over me. I had somebody in the first service who pulled me aside. He got off a plane from Baghdad uh, recently through, uh, through all the crazy stuff that's going on in our world, in that part of the world. And he said, he said I got to tell you, Pastor, there was at least four times where if, if God hadn't provided, protected me, I would be dead right now in the last couple of months. And I said, I want to hear more. And I know this guy. I know his background. And I know that, you know. And I said, I want to hear your story later. It was like one minute before the service. I said, I go up and start the service. But, but we all have those stories where God has protected us. Share that story with people. And look at him saying, I want you to know something. This God who looks over me, he loves you too. He wants to protect you too. He gave his son to have a relationship with you. Jesus arrived over 2,000 years ago. God came from heaven among us. Jesus arrived in my life on the Sacramento Delta about 40 years ago when I received him. And for many of you, he arrived in your life. You know the time. You know when it happened. He moved into your life. He's never left you. And this Christmas season, the arrival of Jesus will come as we walk into the world. Every one of us who believes in Jesus, who has faith in whether you're online or out in the courtyard, family worship venue, worship center, wherever you are, if you know Jesus, he lives in you. Invite him to go with you everywhere you go this Christmas season and all year long. But try it for the next 30 days. Experience the presence of Jesus. Lord, this is our prayer. That we would celebrate that, Jesus, you left the glory of heaven. You came among us. Your incarnation, it's staggering, it's beautiful, it's powerful. That we will celebrate the fact, Jesus, that that for many of us, when we put our faith in you, you moved into us and you'll never leave. And we thank you, Jesus, that for anyone who's not received you, you are as close as a prayer. The moment they cry out to you and ask you to save them from their sin and receive you, Jesus, you will move in, you'll arrive in their life in a way that will be undeniable and life-changing. And Lord, we pray that wherever we go, this Christmas season and beyond, we will recognize that if we are your follower, if you dwell in us, that you are arriving again and again and again. Show your love, show your grace, show your presence through us because we believe in you and you live in us. We pray this in Jesus' beautiful, glorious name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Before I have you stand and send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you a couple words of invitation. First, if you need prayer, and we always need prayer for anything in your life, if you're online, all you need to do is call the phone number there. We have people ready to answer that phone and pray with you. Or if you email to the the email address you see, your prayer need, we'll be praying for it over the next couple of weeks for you. So share your prayers. That way, if you're on campus, anywhere on campus, come into the worship center up front. We'll have teams up front here ready to pray for you. We want to welcome you if you're new at Shoreline. If you're online and you're new and visiting Shoreline, we're glad you're with us. And all you need to do is text the word welcome to the phone number you see on the screen right there, and they will respond back to you and give you a warm personal welcome. If you're on campus, anywhere on campus, and you're new, please take a moment, go by the Connection Center right in the lobby there, and they want to give you a gift bag. Thank you for coming and answering your questions and give you a warm personal welcome. We're so glad you're here and with us today. Uh, today is Ascending Sunday. What that means is anybody who's moving on from our church in the next three to four months, if you're moving on with the military, if you're moving on because you're finishing school over the Christmas break and you're moving out of the area, if you're moving because uh, a job change or just a life change, please don't just disappear. Give us the honor of taking five minutes with you 
giving you a book we want to give you that will encourage you in sharing your faith wherever you go, give you a sending coin that you see on the screen there. That's our encouragement that wherever you go, you go sharing the light and the love of Jesus. And let Sherry and I pray over you and pray for you. We want to take time to do that right when the service ends. We will be under the pergola. What's a pergola, you say? It's that thing right there that's out in the courtyard. Uh, that's a pergola, I've been told. And so we will be right there uh, in just a few moments. Uh, there'll be a team of people that will greet you. They want to give you a sending coin and pray for you. Then you'll meet with Sherry and I and pray for you. But please give us the honor of spending a few moments with you before you head out. Even if you're leaving like in three months, come today because we only, we're going to do this again in about three or four months. And we don't want to miss a chance to say goodbye to you and to give you a word of blessing. And then also as you're leaving today, you're going to notice that we're setting up for 150 or 200 people in a, in a luncheon that's going to be happening out in the courtyard. Uh, that's a volunteer luncheon. If you, if you weren't invited to that volunteer luncheon and you're a volunteer, you'll be invited to the next one. We have, we're, we're going to keep doing these volunteer lunches to bless the people, but that's what's going on out there. I want to invite you, if you're able to stand at home on the campus here, let's stand together and let me send you off with a word of encouragement and blessing. I also want to let you know I get the joy, we've been gone for a few weeks, but I get the joy of preaching the next 14 sermons at Shoreline Church, so you'll be sick of me before you know it, uh, but I'm excited to be back home again and, and in full speed here at the church. Uh, we'll see you next week, but God, as you go from this place, go in the presence of Jesus Christ. He is the meaning of Christmas. Experience his incarnation, he came among us. Experience his inspiration. You are filled with his presence if you're a Christian. If you're not, open your heart to him this Christmas season. And go understanding that you are a living illustration because Jesus goes with you. Go with him, go in him, and shine his light, bring his life everywhere you go. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you back here next Sunday. God bless you.